in and asked for the box office at 30 in the morning, January 29th. Um, on April 4th, um, we're debating it'll either be about 10 bucks or maybe free. I'm not sure yet. It's up to my dean. But on April 4th, I'm going to have a large program. I have an annual Holocaust program every year. We pick a different topic. I've covered White Rose, Hinder Transport, Kristall Knock, uh, Nuremberg Race Laws of 1935, Nuremberg Trials. This goes on. This year, we're going to talk about the spike in anti Semitic hate today on uh, October 7th. I have uh, tentatively the head of the um, ADL, the head of the Southern Poverty Law Center, and the FBI field office chief from Florida uh, coming in, and we're going to go through what's happening. That'll be April 4th at Lynn. All you have to do in February is call the university, ask for the box office. I got it. There we go. Uh, I haven't finished locking everything down or getting the final price from my dean, but uh, by the end of the first week in February, we'll be ready to go. Okay? So those are two of the many programs we have coming up on campus. Of course, if anybody wants to go on a cruise, let me know. <laughs> June is the 80th anniversary of D-Day. So I'm leading a tour and a cruise. We're starting in Bordeaux, going to Amsterdam, and spending some time in Normandy at Enfleur and Cherbourg, going to uh, Omaha and Utah Beach, the American Cemetery, St. Mary Place, Point du Hoc, uh, all those wonderful places in June uh, for the 80th anniversary. So uh, just holler at me if any about any of this stuff. Okay? We ready, boss? Okay. Tammy, thank you. Okay, so today uh, we're going to talk about the Manhattan Project. Um, this is a lecture that I put together, goodness, 25, 28 years ago. And I did it a handful of times and nobody ever wanted it. Um, so I shelved it and then the movie came out and now I've gotten a couple of requests. So I dusted it off and put a PowerPoint together. Um, so how many of you saw the movie about Oppenheimer? Everybody, right? Did you like it? Yeah. Me too, me too. I thought it was beautifully filmed. I thought it was powerful. Of course, it's a, um, a critical moment in world history that we don't spend enough time analyzing. Um, I thought the depiction of some of the scientists was great. There was only one glaring, horrific problem. The depiction of Harry Truman was pathetic, god-awful, completely inaccurate. Um, I, I, I saw the movie, I guess, like three weeks into its run. I was busy. And probably 20 or 30 historians from around the country called me saying, oh, my God, I just saw Oppenheimer. You're going to be furious when you see Truman. And everybody was bitching about it. The depiction of Truman was horrendous. So Oppenheimer sees Truman in the movie, do you remember? And he's whining about, oh, my gosh, what will history say about me, the bomb? And Truman says, you know, I'm the one they're going to remember for dropping the bomb. And then uh, he leaves, and Truman says he's a crybaby and shows him out, right? And Truman was aloof, kind of uh, a dandy, uh, right? Uh, which it was the polar opposite of Harry Truman. Truman did not say to Oppenheimer, you're a crybaby, nor did he say it directly there. What happened was sometime later, Oppenheimer continues to complain. And, you know, oh my gosh, this and that, and what, what would the president say or do? And Truman is asked by his war secretary, Stimson, what does he think about Oppenheimer? He says he's brilliant, but he's a crybaby. So they took that comment in private sometime later and moved it up into the, so it was taken a little out of context, but, but anyway, I thought it was a fantastic film. It's always important to have this kind of conversation. So what we're gonna do today is go through this, you know, thrilling narrative of how the bomb came to be. We'll look at the, um, uh, you know, by dropping the bomb, how many lives were saved, uh, what cities were on the target list, uh, the uranium-235 bomb, uh, Little Boy, and the plutonium bomb, uh, plutonium-239 Fat Man. Uh, the bombs were named, Little Boy was named for Truman, and Fat Man for Churchill. So, uh, <laughs> so we'll look at that. And I'll also, as an historian, I'll try to explain nuclear fission. Um, so here, I'll, I'll do like a little overview, then we'll dive into the weeds here. So basically, in 1938, three of the world's leading physicists, all of them were Germans, three German physicists came up with this idea that uranium uh, can produce an unbelievable energy source, okay? An unbelievable energy source. These German physicists would later be known as the Uranium Club. 
uh, and they were three of the most award-winning celebrated physicists on Earth. And of course, the Nazis grabbed all of them. So the Nazis got off to a start ahead of the rest of the world. What they theorized was there's two types of uranium, 235 and 238. Uranium is a naturally occurring element. It's also one of the heaviest, strongest elements. But yet, ironically, if the neutron hits it in a certain way, it breaks apart. They theorized that when it breaks apart, that creates an unbelievable energy source, which we call fission. Got it? There's a couple problems. Number one, how do you break uranium apart? Number two, once you break it apart, one element, one neutron, uh, excuse me, one atom becomes two, becomes four, eight, 16, and just doubles. Uh, how do you stop it? That's called a chain reaction. If you can control it, it can be a hell of an energy source or something powerful, but how do you control it? Here's the other problem. It's uranium-235 that is the one that can be broken apart into a harness, not 238. Yet, 238 is very common. 235 is not common. One out of every 140 uranium atoms is 235. So how do you separate? How do you get enough uranium? I mean, the size of this clubhouse to, to dig out and get enough uranium-235. If you get enough 235 and you can separate that from 238, that's the stuff that can be weaponized. That's called enrichment. Got it? Today, we use what's called a centrifuge. And everybody knows that term because we were worried about Iran getting a centrifuge, right? And enriching uranium. It doesn't just, it's either, it's not just enriched or not enriched. You have to enrich it to a certain weaponized level. Iran wasn't near that, but nonetheless, it's worrisome. So uh, that's the process now. Uh, so those are some of the problems with how to harness uranium-235. Two years later, in 1940, two Jewish physicists from Germany, uh, Pirols and Frisch, Pirols and Frisch, both theorized a couple of things. One, they came up with an idea on how to harness this, uh, diffusion. So they figured that you get a neutron, you fire a neutron into 235, and then it splits. So we have to find a way of getting 235 then hitting it with a neutron. Their other big contribution besides their brilliant theory was they said, it's inescapable that this unbelievable energy source will be weaponized. Every great and powerful thing has been turned into a weapon at some point in human history, right? From the club to you name it, something sharp, it's always made into a weapon. So Heroes and Frisch said, knowing the Nazis the way we did, they escaped Germany. They said, it's inevitable that Hitler and the Nazis will find a way to weaponize this. So in 1940, they wrote what's known as the 1940 Memo. They sent it to leaders throughout Britain and some of the Allied leaders saying, the Nazis will weaponize this. They called it a super bomb. The world's never seen anything like it. I mean, we can't even calculate how much TNT or traditional explosives would be equivalent to this one super bomb. They theorized, Pirrells and Frisch, and by the way, Pirrells was so brilliant, he was taken under the wing of Enrico Fermi, the great Italian, one of the world's leading physicists on par with an Einstein. Uh, Frisch was taken under the wing of Niels Bohr, a man that even Einstein considered to be the better physicist. Niels Bohr from Copenhagen. So um, those two guys, Fermi and Bohr, uh, realized the talent of these two uh, younger Jewish physicists, and it was Niels Bohr who helped get them out of Germany. Uh, by the way, Niels Bohr would win the Nobel Prize, right, for his scientific work. He was also a handsome fellow, charismatic, and a goalie on their national soccer team. So he was a hero many ways through. You got to love the guy. He used his fame and money, put the money from his prize into getting German, excuse me, Jewish scientists out of Germany. He got them placed in the top academic institutions in Copenhagen, uh, Paris, and then later moved them all to England as the Nazis rolled over France, uh, Norway, the lowland countries, and so on. So he used his influence to get them placed at you know, Manchester, Oxford, Cambridge, and things of that effect. At any rate, so um, the 1940 memo from Pierce and Frisch warned the British government that it's inescapable the Nazis will make this into a bomb. They theorized that this bomb is so powerful that no living structure, nothing we know of, concrete, a bunker, a mountain, nothing could withstand it. Therefore, there's no way to harden defenses. They said the only way to combat this is we need to produce a similar bomb. 
So they encouraged the British to undertake the effort to produce a similar bomb. They theorized what became known as MAD. Anybody heard of MAD or AD? Okay, it's our nuclear deterrence policy from the nuclear age all the way up until modern times. MAD stands for Mutually Assured Destruction. AD stands for Assured Destruction Deterrent. Got it? So here's what they said. If we don't have the bomb, Germany can use the bomb and there's nothing we can do. We can't stop it. The only way to stop them, if we have a bomb, they know that if they hit us, we'll hit them. And they know that the destruction will be so amazing, you know, complete. In other words, assured destruction deterrent. We deter you because we will assure complete destruction. Now, this became the U.S., I guess, basically the, the West's uh, nuclear deterrence policy. This is why, and you all probably find this maddening, no American president will say, I won't use the nuke. Because you can't say you won't use it. You have to say that you will use it. Uh, and we keep building more and more nukes. We have enough to destroy the world several times over, right? It, it doesn't make sense. But um, we need, so our MAD policy in the United States, mutually assured destruction, was that if the Soviets launch first, one, we will launch back. Can never say no. Never say no. Two, we will have enough left that when we launch back, we will not only annihilate the Soviet Union, we will end life on Earth. That's the deterrence. Now, our nuclear deterrence, MAD, and AD, it was based on a three-legged stool, okay? Three-legged stool. Um, uh, one delivery system of this three-legged stool was uh, bombers. We could drop a nuke from a bomb. Number two, subs. Number three, it's called the triad, if anybody's heard of it. Number three would be hardened silos in places like North Dakota. So in other words, if the Soviets were to strike first and hit every runway and destroy every bomber, we'd still have enough in our subs and in the hardened silos to end life on Earth. If the Soviets destroyed every hardened silo and every plane and every runway, we still have enough in the nuclear subs to destroy life on Earth which means we can destroy life on Earth at least minimum three times over. Now that's bad. That's mutually assured destruction, assured destruction deterrent. The analogy that was always used in like the War College or uh, textbooks, West Point, Pentagon, et cetera, is two bullies in a neighborhood. If there's one bully in a neighborhood, he'll pick on everyone. If there's another bully and bully number one knows that bully number two will hit him back, it might deter bully number one. Now, if you really want to deter bully number one, if he hits you, you don't hit him back, you hit him 50 times. If bully number one steps on your toe, you beat him into a coma. And then you burn his house down and hunt down everybody that ever knew him. The point being, that deters him from ever going, ever going anything. So you need to project strength and you need to let them know that I will not hesitate, right? That's the, that's the plan. If bully number one knows that you'll break both his arms and hunt his family down, then he won't mess with you, right? As we all know, if a bully gets away with something, they just get worse and worse and worse, and they just keep doing it. So uh, that's the basis for MAD and AD, mutually assured destruction, assured destruction deterrent. Uh, and we had a triad. Here's the mad irony of MAD. It worked. We went through all those decades of nuclear posturing in the Cold War, and nobody fired. Nobody fired. Now, the problem with MAD and AD today is that MAD and AD assume two rational actors, that the actor knows what will happen, which means, and then number two, it's two governments understand what each government will do. So there's a couple of problems with that. Today, we have sub-state actors, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, Hamas, the many army, you have sub-state actors who are willing to let their children die. What did Gold in my ears say when they learned to love their children more than they hate us? Only then will we find peace. Uh, they want to meet virgins in heaven and blow themselves up. So if you're that stark raving looney tunes, the notion that you will be blown up or hit back does not deter you from acting. Relatedly, we've seen here in the U.S. and all around the world stark raving lunatics elected to high office <laughs> who are not rational, not realistic, not sane, and don't hire decent people. So MAD and AD are hanging by a thread. And the kicker is we have not come up with a viable 
nuclear deterrence alternative. So we still are using them, but it's antiquated. So that's what Perils and Frisch postulate. Postulate. Now, they said that there's possibly two ways that you could weaponize this. In other words, extract the 235, right? Hit it with the neutron by breaking it apart. Uh, fusion, right? Fission, and then enrich it. Um, one is what they call diffusion, uh, where you just extract it. Number two is heavy water. Those are the two theories. The United States would go with diffusion. The Nazis went with heavy water. No one knew at the time. It turned out that heavy water doesn't work. <laughs> Turns out that fission, diffusion does work. The difference in the United States, FDR hired the best of the best of the best, consulted with Enrico Fermi, Niels Bohr, hires Oppenheimer, and others who said, here's what we think. In Nazi Germany, Hitler said, I know more than all my generals. And we're going to use heavy water. And the world's leading heavy water plant was in Norway at the time. And Hitler was obsessed, the Wehrmacht plant. Hitler was obsessed with Norway. Obsessed with it. Because the Norwegians, he thought, were the perfect Aryans. They were the tall, lean, muscular, blonde, blue-eyed, ubermensch, lords on earth, master supermen. In other words, people that look just like Hitler. <laughs> and Goebbels, and Hitler, and Speer, and Eichmann, and Gorman, and hell, the rest of them, right? Goring. Um, so he was obsessed with it. And the Norwegians were moving aggressively ahead with this heavy water experiment. And Norway also had some of the greatest scientists. The Germans were ahead of the world, but Norway not too far behind. So he went with heavy water, thank God. But no one knew at the time, it was a race a mad race to get the bomb, right? So uh, with that said, let's slow it down and we'll go through step by step. And look at all this salute. Um, so at the end of World War II, it's total war, everybody. It's total war. So um, we need to remember Europe was in complete ruins, as was parts of North Africa, parts of Manchuria, China, Japan, Micronesia, Melanesia, Polynesia. Chuk, Koshrai, Guam, Yap, Papua New Guinea. I mean, the world was in ruins, right? Um, wow. World War II is the world's worst war. Sometimes when people say, why did we drop the bomb? You have to remind them that at least six zero, 60 million people died. 60 million. What wouldn't you do to end the world's worst nightmare? Coinciding with World War II was the Holocaust, the world's worst case of genocide. Hitler was hell bent on global conquest and annihilating entire groups of people. What wouldn't you do, right? And the Japanese, too. There were some parallels between the Japanese and the Nazis. They both were obsessed with racial superiority. The Nazis believed that there were two racial groups the master race and the mud race. The master race were Germanics and Scandinavians, Aryans. The mud race were Southern Europeans, Africans, folks in the Middle East, the New World. Asians and Jews. Everybody else was the mud race. The master race was known as civilization builders. The mud race known as civilization destroyers. Every great civilization was built by, now, the kick of, you know, by Aryans. Uh, in schools in the 1930s, I have a different lecture where I look at what Hitler required as teaching in the schools, what books were read, what books were banned. Remember, dictators always ban books. Um, so, uh, although not as many as Florida, but um, <laughs> um, yeah, Diary of Anne Frank, The Kill a Mockingbird, Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse Five, J.D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rye, Alice Walker's Color Purple, yeah, uh, Animal Farm, yeah, it's amazing. So I require these books in my classes. So um, anyway, yeah, we have a freeze on Animal Farm on Monday. So uh, anyway, to the students here. So. Um, at any rate, um, so what Hitler ordered taught in schools was that it was a group of German engineers and, and, and architects 4,000 years ago that went to Egypt and built the pyramids. This is what they taught in German schools. Uh, also taught that it was a group of German philosophers that 2,000, a couple hundred years ago, they went to 
Athens and taught Socrates. Um, some generals went to Rome 2,000 years ago, built a Colosseum, the uh, Circus Maximus, and trained the centurions. My favorite from German schools in the 30s was that um, there was a German carpenter named Joseph <laughs> who went to the Middle East and met a Middle Eastern teenager named Mary, and they had a German baby. <laughs> Jesus, Helmut, Gunther Schmidt. You know? They taught this stuff. Now, here's the kicker. If you could take a time machine, you go back to Germany in 1932. Hitler rises to power January 33. What you find is German scientific, cultural, and academic institutions were the envy of the planet. The Germans were among the best read, best traveled. Hitler comes to power and in no time at all gets them to believe up and down, good is bad, and complete fooey nonsense. How can that happen? Moreover, Hitler was not a tall, dashing war hero and charismatic, you know, humanitarian. Hitler was a compulsive liar, a narcissist, a failure in business, a, a, a weird dude, a weird hair dude, uh, who was a corporal in World War One, a corporal and a mediocre artist. And the people followed him into committing the world's most heinous crimes and suspending rationality and science and everything else. From that to that. But you know, the same thing happened in Italy with Mussolini, who was also a lying, narcissistic failure and an oddball. Same thing happened in Spain with Franco, lying, narcissistic father. Same thing happened in Japan with Tojo. Same thing happened in Portugal with Salazar. The same thing has happened throughout history. It happens everywhere, all the time. Um, now, Japan also believed in racial superiority. The irony of Japanese culture is it's a lot younger than Chinese or Korean. And the writing, the Buddhist and Shinto beliefs, a lot of the cultural practices all came over basically from China and Korea. But Japan used to teach that it was in Japan and they stole the Japanese. <laughs> you can teach right is wrong, just invert everything. And in Japan, and in Germany, they taught that other racial groups, and ironically, Japan considered the Chinese and Koreans not only a different racial group, but almost a different species. The Nazis considered non-Aryans almost a different species. They got that from Martin Luther, who in the year 1545 wrote a book, The Jews and Their Lives, where he said, Jews are a different species. They don't have souls. There's no kingdom of heaven. Uh, therefore, they're not human. Um, wow. Bad science is not benign. You can get people to believe all kinds of shit, right? So um, so the Japanese and Germans both had this crazy racial belief. They also were hell-bent on conquest. Japan believed that once upon a time, all of Asia in a Japanese empire. The answer, nope. Uh, the first people to come to Japan, maybe only 35,000 years ago, right? And there was not a great Japanese empire. Hitler taught that there was once a continental-wide European empire run by Germans. He talked about the Third Reich. Yes, the Third Reich would be the Thousand-Year Reich, the Thousand-Year Reign. It only lasted 12 years, thank God. Um, the Second Reich was the 1870s when the modern state of Germany was created. That was the Second Reich. What was the First Reich? Hitler ordered taught in schools that during medieval times there was a continental-wide Great German emperor, empire led by the Great German Emperor Charlemagne. <laughs> he was French. Yeah. He was French. So never mind your understanding of history, you can get people to believe anything. So this is the kind of so there's some crazy parallels. So you have we have suspended humanity, no empathy, suspended rationality and reason, 60 million people dead, the world's worst case of genocide. Europe was in ruin. Now remember, virtually every major city was bombed, right? which means open sewage systems were festering, which means none of the fields were planted. You're not growing tomatoes or corn in the middle of the war. Uh, animal husbandry, the farm animals are dead, which means there's no food for the end of the war. Uh, there's also no medicine, no nothing, no coal, no heating oil. But how do you get the coal, heating oil, medicine, and food to Europe? The ships are sunk, the ports are blown up, the planes are blown up and the airports are destroyed. The bridges, trucks, trains, train tracks, and roads are all destroyed. So the world was facing the dark ages. Truman said that we could have like a biblical apocalypse where hundreds of thousands, at least people, die across Europe because there's no food, no medicine, no clothing, and that first winter's coming. 
In other words, we don't need a one or two year long bloody protracted war in Japan. Also, let us remember what the Japanese were doing. They were hell-bent on conquering the entirety of Asia and the Pacific. Brutally. The rape of Nanking, anybody? At least 200,000 Chinese, Manchurian, right, killed. Um, and raped, not twice or three times, but raped hundreds of times by hundreds of soldiers and then beheaded by them. Um, the Japanese had a game they played throughout the Pacific. They would get babies and throw them in the air and catch them on their swords. They also piled up children, stripped them, lit, put fuel on them, and lit them on fire alive. I mean, this was madness. Let us remember Iwo Jima, an insignificant volcanic rock. And we bomb it by air and sea for days, and we send the Marines in. In fact, some of the estimates were there would be no resistance. <laughs> Who could survive that bombing? The Japanese inflicted 26,000 casualties on our best soldiers for an insignificant volcanic piece of rock. Truman said, imagine what they're going to do when we invade the fatherland. This is going to be an, a bloodbath. The Japanese weren't going to surrender. There's a revisionist history right now, in fact, even in Japan where they're saying, oh, we were trying to surrender. Truman was a warmonger. We were trying to surrender. The answer, God, no. In fact, um, it's declassified now. You can read it. Uh, I've read it. It's in the Truman Presidential Library, the National Archives, Archives in the Library of Congress. It might even be in Mar-a-Lago. So uh, <laughs> it's declassified. It won't be there. Uh, so it's declassified. Smooth. That's declassified. Here's what it said. We cracked the Japanese code. And what we found out, we believed that Japan had no airplanes left, which means we could dock hundreds of ships off the coast and then hit the beaches. But what we found out was Japan had enough planes left with just enough gas to get airborne, not return to base. One bomb and a kamikaze pilot held that on being a suicide bomb. Now imagine all those ships with thousands of men shuttling ashore, and out of the clouds come kamikazes. Even if you're the world's greatest anti-aircraft gunner, you can hit them, but you can't stop them if they want to fly in you. I mean, it, it was going to be a bloodbath. Uh, when we cracked the Japanese code, Truman couldn't say anything. Because if we said something, they would change the code. And by the way, the Japanese and Germans were unbelievably advanced in encrypting their codes and cracking ours. So it was hell to crack that. You couldn't say anything. So people believe Japan didn't have an air force, so why don't we just land? And uh, Relatedly, in the code, it showed that they were giving Japanese boys a hand grenade, but on a stick. And they were told, don't throw the hand grenade, you could miss. Go up and lie down under the tank or truck tracks and then pull the pin. Long before Al-Qaeda, right? Suicide bombers. Japanese women were given a vial of a poison and a sharpened bamboo stick. They were told when the Americans come to your house or come to give you chocolate or whatever they were doing, you stab them right with a rib cage opens up. This was going to be a town by town, street by street, house by house, room by room, guerrilla warfare. Truman asked the military, the Pentagon was created after uh, the war, the Department of Defense was, uh, was created after the war, we had Department of uh, War. Truman asked them for estimates. They said minimum for the invasion of Japan, 250,000 American soldiers gone. Maximum, a half a million, 500,000. This thing would last minimum a year, billions of dollars. Meanwhile, Russia, the Soviets, were eyeing up the northern Japanese islands, the Kuril Islands, okay? Rich fishing grounds, ports, boats, and it hadn't been bombed. So you could have, there was a Russo-Japanese war in the early 1900s. You could have another one on the eve of World War II. In other words, we got to end this thing. Feed and save Europe and get the world back on its feet. So remember all that as we talk about whether to drop or not. So those are the questions swirling here. Uh, so fission, okay, there's your explanation. Three German physicists, and they published this in the academic journals. So it was out there. It's just that who the hell can read it and understand it? And it was still very theoretical. 
We're not sure how to identify 235, uranium 235 from U-238 and how to break it apart, fission. But that was the theory. Uranium is the heaviest of all naturally occurring elements, but if hit by a neutron, the 235 breaks apart and releases an unbelievable amount of energy. If you keep hitting it, you create a chain reaction. How do you stop it? Uh, they didn't know. So that's the uh, fission chain reaction. The problems I mentioned earlier, 235, that's the sweet one, but it's one out of every 140 uranium atoms. So how do you get it? How do we break it apart? How do we enrich? And that is just get 235. Uh, nobody knew how to do it. They theorized diffusion or heavy water, but it was still very theoretical at the time. What's amazing about this, the Manhattan Project, and by the, by the way, Kiros and Frisch told the British, and the British created something called tube alloys, 1940. That was the predecessor to the Manhattan Project. Britain then sent it over to us, and we renamed it, because the first office was on Broadway. Da, 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 give me, it's like Mel Brooks should have written the atomic bomb thing, right? Like springtime for Hitler, right? Now only Mel Brooks can pull, only Mel Brooks can pull that off, right? Um, good God. Um, so, um, uh, and I admit I laughed, but um, so uh, that's tube alloys. That that's 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 the concern. Um, but what's amazing about this is there was not a field of nuclear engineering. As they're developing the theories for nuclear power and nuclear weapons, they also have to develop the engineering. We didn't have centrifuges. We didn't have anything. So on the fly, they're developing the theory, the physics, and also the engineering, which just gives you a sense of the genius of Enrico Fermi, Robert J. Oppenheim, J. Robert Oppenheimer, and, and Niels Bohr and these guys, uh, Fuchs of the other one. So there's the two Jewish uh, physicists, Pierce and Frisch. Uh, Piers Piers was grabbed up by Enrico Fermi and Niels Bohr grabbed them. For this is how sharp these guys were. Uh, they were at the top of their class, of course, top professors and researchers and scientists. There's a brief bio. Frisch studied at Vienna. Uh, Piers at the University of Berlin. He was a professor at Munich and Leipzig. Uh, at, uh, went to the University of Copenhagen, University of London. I studied there. Birmingham, etc. So just uh, remarkable uh, stuff. So these guys are on the cutting edge. Thank God Niels Bohr's got him out of Germany. One thing to think about is the talent among German engineers and scientists and physicists. Um, at the end of the war, Operation Paperclip, Harry Truman authorized basically a snatch and grab. We're gonna grab these uh, uh, German physicists and engineers and bring them to the US. It was very controversial because a lot of them were given a nice slab and told to do research. Werner von Braun, he put us on the moon essentially and developed our rocket systems, right? Uh, but I support Truman's operation because if we didn't grab them, who was going to grab them? Right. Well, yeah, Soviets, yeah. And then they would have beat us to the moon, they would have beat us to the atomic front, they would have beat us in science, they would have beat us in. And it's hard to even put a price tag on what was developed through this. So, this is, but fortunately, um, Niels Bohr got a lot of the great Jewish scientists out of Germany uh, to help us. Um, Pearls and Frisch. So this was their argument. Uh, it's irresistible. The Germans will develop a super bomb, and the only defense is if we develop ours because of MAD and AD, right? Mutually assured destruction, assured destruction deterrent, which was our nuclear policy uh, on the triad, right? Everybody's heard of this? Yeah, okay, all right, two battles. That's Enrico Fermi, uh, and he came on board to help us with the theoretical aspect of what was happening. There was a young German student named Klaus Fuchs, uh, who was, um, even Oppenheimer and Fermi said he's frighteningly intelligent. And he was the one coming up with a lot of the ideas on diffusion, on using a neutron to break it apart, how do we separate U-235 from 238? So they brought him in and they gave him unfettered access to everything. After the war, we found out he was spying for the Soviets. Yeah, he didn't spy for the Germans, thank God. But he was sending everything to the Soviets, and he helped them play catch up. He was later captured and imprisoned for several years after the war by the British. Then he was released from prison. He went to East Germany and became a professor and a researcher and lived comfortably. I think they should have put him away for life. Or... I'm against the death penalty, with the exception of 
treason. Um, if you're threatening, and this threatened glo the global order, if it's treason, no, God, you have the death penalty. Other than that, I oppose it in all cases. Um, so there's two approaches I told you about uh, diffusion and heavy water. So here's the theory that Pearls and Frisch came up with. So uranium-235 is a little lighter than 238. So you put it in this chamber, the uranium atoms, right? You turn it, uh, Pearls and Frisch came up with this idea, let's turn it into a gas. So don't even ask me how you turn an atom into a gas. I, I don't understand. I know Mexican food. I don't know how this works. So you turn it into a gas. Okay, this is why I'm an historian. Okay, I got A's and everything except chemistry and physics. And that's much. Um, so you turn it into a gas. U two thirty five is lighter, so it rises up. You have a cylinder that presses air through this. It will push the uranium out through that cylinder. There you have like a net mesh, a mesh netting rather. And the U-235, the gases will be pushed out and you capture them. After this diffusion process, what do you have? Just 235. Now you get rid of the 238. That's called enrichment. So I, I don't understand any, don't ask me to explain anything beyond that. Uh, now, Enrico Fermi and Niels Bohr were asked, okay, is this going to work? And they said, you know what, this will work. But here's the problem. You're going to need thousands of scientists, multi-million, I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars in labs. You're going to need supplies of uranium the size of this building. It's going to be a monstrous undertaking. And they said Britain can't pull it off. They don't have the budget, the labs, the number of scientists. Only the U.S. can. So Enrico Fermi and Niels Bohr told the U.S., you need to move. We all know about Einstein's memo to FDR. Everybody, right? Yeah. where Einstein told FDR the Nazis are ahead of us and they could develop an atomic weapon. Therefore, we need to do it. Coming from Einstein, that's that's pretty strong of an argument. But also Enrico Fermi and Bohr said the same thing. So they were all putting a full court press on FDR and he agreed and Britain agreed and they transferred everything from two alloys to us and we set up an office in Broadway and created it. Only the U.S. could pull this off. Um, you know, I worry about this today. Because we've lost our industrial base, our manufacturing base. We don't have science. STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Go to a good graduate school anywhere in the U.S. and find me an American student. And I'm not an American first guy. I'm pro-immigration. I'm, you know, my kids are half Anglo, half Latino, right? My ex was from Argentina and Ecuador. Um, I'm not, I've never been that kind of person. Um, but you go to a good graduate school, there's no American students. I'm a professor 34 years now, I think it is. Uh, I taught in London, Paris, Hawaii, Yale, Georgetown, Stanford, Northern Arizona. Never could never hold a job. Um, I, I, I literally moved every year because I grew up in this family of uneducated steel mill workers, right, sis, uh, in Steelton, Pennsylvania, who went to the fourth grade, sixth grade. So I knew I was getting my ass out of town. Uh, and I didn't want calluses on my hands, so I... And fortunately, I was good in football, basketball, track wrestling, so I got an athletic scholarship to pay for an education. And goodbye now. Um, but um, uh, anyways, I'm digressing. I'm all over the place. But, um, uh, I worry about this today because we don't have the brain power in this country. Here's what I know as a professor in all these schools. The American students are taking freshman math for the third time. Like, what's this long division? There's numbers. You know. um, and the students from Europe are going, we had this in ninth grade. This is ridiculous. Uh, and the students from Asia love it. Uh, we're getting our butts kicked, everybody. Uh, now with this anti-immigrant mentality, send them home, get them out of the U.S. You know what? They're going to go home and kick our ass economically. I want them all staying here. I want them working for IBM and, and Apple and and then you know Ford and, and I want them here to develop whatever is the next version of, uh, you know, nanotechnology or the internal combustion, combustion engine, whatever the next threshold is. Uh, so I, I don't know that we could do this today, right? And hell, 40 some percent of the country doesn't believe in science. I wish they'd stop using their television since it's science. Right? Don't drive a car then, join the Amish. Um, heavy water, don't ask me to explain this either. Um, 
So you take H2O, right? Uh, and you, turn, you change it through deuterium oxide and it's a heavy water and that water can act as a facilitating agent to produce this fission process uh, with uranium. That's the theory. Uh, and the Germans bought into this, Hitler pushed them, and the Norwegians were working on it. And the Fehrenbach plant uh, in the middle of nowhere in Norway was the world's leading producer of heavy water. One of many reasons why Hitler wanted to hit Norway. Plus, he, as I told you, he was fascinated with the Aryans of Norway. Um, here's the Uranium Club. These are the three German scientists who are basically ahead of every, ahead of Einstein. Einstein was a theoretical physicist, theoretical. Um, head of everybody in the applied sciences here. And, and this is the kind of brain power Hitler had lined up. So this is what we're up against. So Fermi and Bohr's join us, which levels the playing field and encourage us to move quickly because these guys are that sharp. So yikes. Um, that's the Wehrmacht plant uh, in Norway, the world's leading producer of heavy water. So um, 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 the Nazis want to take the plant. And it's filled with all this heavy water. And the view at the time was heavy water can make a new an atomic bomb. So, oh my God. Um, so people were panicked about what they're gonna do. So the uh, April 9th, 1940, the Nazis invade Norway and uh, the Norwegians put up a stingy defense. Norwegian police officers fought, there was an underground resistance, but I mean, the Nazis have tanks and warships off the coast and bombers and fighters, and, and eventually Norway was taken. Um, and the Nazis are there taking over that. This guy is, is a, he's James Bond meets the rock, uh, Leif Tronstad. Um, believing that heavy water can make an atomic bomb, Leif Tronstad almost single-handedly prevents Germany from getting a hold of the heavy water. He's a Norwegian special forces commando and physicist. How about that? Uh, so an impressive cat. Um, Tronstadt, what he does is he works with the French intelligence, uh, the Ducian Bureau, Inspector Clouseau, and a couple others. <laughs> so he works with French intelligence, and they sneak into Norway, and they grab the heavy water, put it on a ship, and get it out. They take it to France. And the Nazis come in and hit it. Now, the Nazis then invade France. So Tronstadt smuggles it out and takes it to Scotland by Scapa Flow, right? So, I mean, just days in advance of the Nazis, he's single-handedly running these covert ops everywhere. So the question now is, um, do we blow up uh, the Wehrmacht plant? Or do we, now the concern by Tronstadt, as he said, the electrolysis system, this system that creates heavy water is under several feet of concrete. We're gonna bomb it and it's still gonna be operational. It's still gonna be operational plus, they're using Norwegian civilians and scientists inside the plant. We're going to kill a lot of them. So Tronstadt tells the Americans who want to bomb, bomb, bomb. He says, let me sneak inside and I'll set detonators and destroy them. And he comes up with a couple of plans. Um, so there he is in the front here, uh, training Roger Moore. And um, <laughs> right? Yeah. Looks like it. Now, here he is training British and Norwegian special forces um, company Ninja. And what they're going to do is they're going to um, take these gliders uh, pulled by these huge bombers, right? Um, and they're going to cut the gliders. And they're going to fly into Norway, land secretly, and then they're going to go across the snow, across the landscape, and get into the, the facility. Um, you know that in D Day, June of 44, we used gliders, right? Horse gliders, right? Pulled by Lancaster bombers and other large bombers. And they're on a, a you know, cable, and they cut that cable and they, they float. Well, that's difficult to do. During D-Day, the night before, so late evening, midnight before the, the attack, on what date, uh, Karen? When was D-Day? June what? June 6th. Yeah, your birthday. June 6th, 2002. Is that right? <laughs> that's what she told me. Um, anyway, so... Um, so 50% of our horse and gliders wrecked because it was cloudy and rainy, windy. Now the problem in Norway is it's the winter and the weather is God awful. So they get this plan and they get these horse uh, gliders, they train the commandos. Thank God, 
Tronstadt was not on the first attack wave. He was coming in later. Um, to give you some sense, behind the plant, it's a sheer walled mountain. So you got to be like a world-class mountain climber to scale down. In front of them, look at this. There's one bridge across, and it's armed to the teeth and heavily mined. So how do you even get down and just go and come back up? And then what do you, how do you get in? So it's impregnable kind of a thing. So Tronstad comes up with the plan, trains all the commandos. There they are working at it. There's a, a horse of gliders called, pulled by Halifax bombers. He gets the commanders. They're pulled by this. There's two of them coming in. The weather is so bad. One of the bombers has no visibility and runs right into the mountain. So it and the glider are destroyed. The other one, they cut the cable, the glider gets turned upside down, crashes, everybody dies. So thank God Tronstadt wasn't a part of it. The Americans said, oh, now we're going to bomb. Tronstadt said, no, I'm going to lead the next mission. Uh, so they're going to come back. The Swallow team, there's Tronstadt and his team. Here's the one bridge across. What they're going to do is they're going to attack at this in the middle of February in Norway, in northern Norway. It's below freezing. What they're going to do is they're going to parachute in uh, near the Norwegian-Swedish border, and they're going to ski all the way to Norway, all the way to the plant. There's a contact of Tronstads who works in the plant. He's one of the engineers. When the shift changes at night, he's going to leave the one door propped open. Before the shift changes again, and the guards Tronstad only has moments to get in, put the explosives on all the electrolysis machines, blow it and get out. That's the plan. So uh, uh, there's the things that they have to blow up. So they parachute, <laughs> ski across the country in the middle of the winter. Uh, they get there. Everything's running late. The shift runs late. They manage to finally get in at the time the next shift is coming. So Tronstadt says, set your timers for just seconds. We're going to sacrifice ourselves. And they put bombs on everything, on all these. Uh, they go running out. It blows. Tronstadt lives. Lives through it. He goes into the mountains, gets his skis, and skis back to Sweden. <laughs> Badass, right? Thank, I just hope Tom Cruise doesn't play him in the movie. <laughs> or Johnny Depp. Right? Um, so, um, or Matt Damon or any one of them. Um, so anyways, they blew it up from inside successfully. Uh, the problem was that there was a container, a storage area that still had some heavy water. So Tronstadt finds out from his intelligence network, the Nazis loaded on the ship, the Hydra. Tronstadt goes back in. Now he's a frogman underwater. He boards the Hydra, puts explosives on the ship, jumps overboard, blows it, and sinks the ship with the rest of the heavy water. Amazing, right? So he continually... Uh, uh, prevents all the Nazi plans. Now, today we know they wouldn't have made it, but at the time we thought that this was going to produce an atomic bomb. So this guy's amazing. Uh, here's your sad ending. That's him. At the end of the war, the Germans know it's all gone. So they, they establish, Hitler establishes a scorched earth policy. In Norway, they're going to just reduce Norway to ruin. Uh, blow up every industrial facility, school, hospital, water, electrical, and just leave Norway completely destroyed. They're going to salt the fields. Nothing will grow. So this is what they're doing. So Tronstad goes back into, into Norway with his commandos to kill the Nazi squads that are destroying it. One of his men gets caught, rats on him. He gets captured. And in March, just weeks before the war ends, they torture and kill him. So that's the last known image of Tronstad. Uh, leading the resistance. So what an amazing, amazing guy. Um, so Einstein's letter, August 2, 39. Uh, then, of course, Niels Bohr and Enrico Fermi push Einstein. Then Pierce and Frisch, the two Jewish scientists, also push them. And FDR agrees. He establishes, uh, based on the initial letter, um, covert operations in the Bureau of Standards. Um, Enrico Fermi and Niels Bohr say, this is not going to do it. It's a small department with a couple of people. You need something massive. So FDR creates the U.S. Office of Research and Development. Fermi and Bohr say, that's not big enough. You need to move it. Pearl Harbor happens. FDR listens to them finally and moves it to the Army Corps of Engineers. So now we're going to mobilize the entire military, the entire country, to build an atomic bomb. 
The first offices were on 270 Broadway, thus the name Manhattan Project. The leadership is under these guys, Julius Robert Oppenheimer. Um, he probably never should have been picked. He was having affairs. He was a communist. He was kind of a flaky professor. I mean, today, right? Uh, but he was brilliant. He was brilliant. And if you have the likes of Fermi and, and, and Pirols and Frisch and Boers saying this guy's sharp. So thank God you had in a president and administration that listened to scientists and people. So they picked Oppenheimer, and I'll be damned if he doesn't get it done, right, everyone? The military commander in charge and Matt Damon did a lousy job playing in the movie. It's Leslie Groves. Groves was an Army Corps of Engineer and a badass. So he knew about engineering. He was tough. He was known for being ridiculously disciplined and organized. He also thought out of the box. Groves didn't just use the military. He went to academia. He went to the best universities in the country. He went to corporate America. He said, I need all of you on board with this project. So he went, you know, across fields, cross disciplines, ridiculously organized. Uh, Oppenheimer has this famous meeting with um, Groves where he tells Groves there's two theories, diffusion or heavy water. Groves says, I don't know anything about this. Pitch me. And Oppenheimer says, probably not heavy water. Groves says, okay, then we're going to go with that. Thank God. Then Groves said, okay, now tell me how we do it. Oppenheimer says, either uranium-235 or plutonium-239. We're not sure. So Groves says, well, then we're going to produce bombs with each of those as a backup plan. So the first bomb we dropped, little man on Hiroshima, was U-235. Because we felt better about that. We figured that would work. Plutonium, we had no idea. So we saved that for Nagasaki for the second bomb three days later. So Groves was brilliant in his leadership. He was tough. He was disciplined. I thought Matt Damon was too soft and aloof, um, quite frankly. Um, uh, top secret facilities. Groves ordered that three massive facilities be built. Los Alamos in New Mexico, Oak Ridge in Tennessee, and Hanford in Washington. Um, the 235 is from Oak Ridge. Uh, Washington is where they can make the plutonium, okay? So all that. The Manhattan Project, by 1942, had a staff of 130,000 people. Amazing, right? Here's the kicker. The average age of the scientists was 28. About half of them were PhD students, right? I mean, crazy, right? But what they did is if Fermi and Bohr's and Oppenheimer are there, the rest of the best of the best are going to want to go work on it. Um, so... Uh, that average age is just remarkable. You all heard of Ben Ferenz? He was the last living prosecutor at Nuremberg, right? Uh, he lived at Kings Point. Delray had just died last spring, right? So uh, anybody get to hear Ben? Or Yeah, okay, he's great. I got to interview him. He was amazing. Ben was like, what, 4'10", about 70 pounds? And he was sharp as a tack at 102. He was funny. He was an amazing guy. At any rate, he told me something pretty amazing. His first job out of law school, the Nuremberg trials. He was in his mid-20s. And guess what he was assigned? There were 13 Nuremberg trials. There was the main trial where we had 20 plus senior Nazis. Then after that, we had 12 subsequent tribunals. The British were broke, the French, the Gaul refused to cooperate, Stalin left. So the 12 subsequent were just run by us. And one of them was, we, we, we tried um, um, Nazi doctors, one Nazi judges, one Nazi professors, journalists, uh, Nazi industrials. We tried all these different groups. Um, they tried IG Farben, for example, right? Who used Holocaust labor and, and manufactured Zyklon B, right? Um, but one of the most dicey trials where they had two dozen members of the Einsat group. These are the Nazi death squads. And 20-some-year-old, four-foot-ten, recent law grad, Ben Ferenz, was in charge of prosecuting the most monstrous Nazis, and he kicked their ass. Um, so, wow. So these scientists were PhD students. Now, here's the kicker. The Soviet Union and the Germans kind of figured out what we were doing. Not exactly what we were doing, but they knew we were up to something. Why? Because all of a sudden, through the 1940s, Oppenheimer stops publishing. Niels Bohr stops publishing. Enrico Fermi stops publishing. Klaus Fuchs stops publishing. You get the point? I mean, you know, if uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin and, 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 and 
John Meekham, and, and, and if, if all of a sudden nobody writes books, something's going on, right? So none of these guys were publishing, so they figured they were all together working on something. The details, however, they didn't know. The Soviets had more information because Klaus Fuchs was leaking it uh, to them. The Nazis, though, not. So anyways, no scholarly articles for this couple-year period, right? And academia is what? Publish and perish, right, everybody? Right, we churn these bad boys out. So um, anyway, it gets me great pay raises at Lynn. <laughs> anyway, so 235 of plutonium. So I told you, uranium is a naturally occurring plutonium they have to manufacture. Uh, don't ask me how they get the chemistry behind manufacturing. Um, the concern, and there's an interesting uh, scene in the movie, which is based on real life, where General Groves asked Oppenheimer, okay, we start this thing, we split it. How do we stop it? Could this just blow up the planet? Same with when they did the Trinity test. If we drop that Trinity bomb in New Mexico, Will it create another chain reaction and will it just go through the atmosphere? And Oppenheimer said, probably not. <laughs> Rose is like, well, what percentage? Oppenheimer said, I don't know. Rose is like, 1%. Oppenheimer says, probably not. So they didn't know. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, at any rate, so enough of all that. Let me move. Uh, that's Niels Bohr. Uh, so that's the great uh, scientist from Copenhagen who really is the glue. Oppenheimer's attracted him. Even Einstein listens to him. Enrico Fermi does. Everybody. Uh, FDR. So Niels Bohr, and he's the one that kept saying only the United States can build it. We need more and more people, more and more of a budget. So he's backing General Gross on everything. Uh, young guy. Um, so testing and development. You've all heard of the Trinity test? So they have to pick a site, middle of New Mexico, right? Um, Los Alamos in July of 45, pre-dawn, cold day. Now, nobody knows exactly what's going to happen. They got buses and they moved the families away. The scientists were told, you all can leave too. Some of them did. Most of the senior people like Oppenheimer wanted to stay for the test. One of the things General Grove says, if this goes wrong, we're back to zero because we've lost all of our top scientists. But they wanted to stay. In the movie, they're pretty close. In the real world, they were 20 miles away. Uh, in the movie, they have like ZZ Top cheap sunglasses on, <laughs> minus the beards. But in the real world, they were they were quite some distance. But 20 miles is still just 20 miles, right? And nobody knew what was going to happen. General Groves prepared uh, multiple press releases. One of them, which he sent out before the test, saying we're all dead, and the war is probably over. The other one is we've unleashed the atomic genie. We've changed the world and we're going to win this thing. So thank God, right? Uh, it didn't happen. Uh, it was described as brighter than a thousand suns, the Trinity test. Another scientist there said night turned into day. I thought the director of the movie did a good job with the sound. Uh, this is not my area of research. I don't write books or articles or anything. I just was interested in the Truman angle 25 plus years ago. Uh, but I did read a lot of the diaries of these guys. And it wasn't just day turned, night turned into day in a thousand suns. The thing that they all talked about was the sound. Light travels faster than sound. And the movie, they did a good job with this. They saw the detonation and they were all in shock and awe of what was happening, the mushroom cloud, the bright light, everything. And then a couple of minutes later, they heard hell. Oh, that sound that nobody has ever heard before. And the sound was devastating. So that scared the hell out of everybody. There's a picture of it. Lest we forget the horrors of this, right? Um, so the target list. Truman says, I need a target list. So he gets the Pentagon working on Where are we going to drop it? We get a target list together. Um, the invasion of Japan is set for November 1. So Truman wants the weapon operational and a target list well in advance of November 1. We got to hit him before the invasion. Um, they're planning 700, three quarters of a million troops that month, half a million dead. I mean, think about that. Three quarters of a million land, we lose a half a million. Uh, it's unimaginable. So now, a lot of bad scholars and uninformed people say, why didn't Truman show the Japanese a test? Well, one, we only had two bombs ready to go. So that cuts us down to one bomb. What if it was a dud? So others say, drop it in the ocean, Sean. Well, that doesn't have the effect. 
Truman reminded everybody that the Japanese were throwing babies on, in the air, thousands and killing them and mass raping and murdering and taking over the world, burning entire villages. We also firebombed, yes, dozens incendiary buses. We dropped tons and tons of firebombs all across Japan. We destroyed dozens of their cities and the Japanese regime was basically F you. We need shock and awe. We need to hit them like they've never been hit before to end this thing. So he wants a city that's not too big, because you don't want to just blow up part of the city, but not too small, because if you level a little town. He wants a city that's geographically concentrated, so we can say that an entire city ceases to exist, a major city. That's how you get their attention. Now, that's some harsh stuff, but that's what you have to do. So he wants a... Um, Target the committee has a goal of giving him the list by July 25. He wants large urban areas, but three miles plus in diameter, not too big, not too big. He wants strategic sites, not just civilian. He wants, you know, air bases. He wants barracks. He wants where they refine oil, major ports. He wants military sites to not only hit command and control and communications, but to cripple their military response, their ability to respond militarily. So that's what he assigns everybody. We got to get Japan's attention. Um, so Kokura was the first one on the list. It contained one of the largest weapons factory, not only in Japan, but in the planet. So we could eliminate that. Um, Yokohama, outside of Tokyo, we don't want to kill Hirohito. He's a god on earth. Truman wants him to be alive, so he will surrender. Remember, if Hirohito told the Japanese, stand on your left foot, everybody would just go like this. So he's a god on earth, right? So um, Yokohama, because of the oil refineries and industry there, Hiroshima, army headquarters, massive supply and storage. Massive. Kyoto, uh, which used to be the capital of Japan until the, what is it, the Meishi, Meishi, Meishi uh, realignment in like 18, late 1800s. So when it moved to uh, uh, Tokyo, um, it has a lot of industry, but Kyoto is the cultural capital of Japan. Truman said, take it off the list. He was disturbed by the firebombing of Dresden, which our students don't know about because that's one of the banned books. Of foreign, excuse me, foreign <laughs> dough. Um, Kurt Vonnegut, yes. Who read, uh, who read Slaughterhouse Five? Okay. So he was an American POW in Barracks Five. And the Allies, we bombed Dresden. There was no military value to it. We lost medieval architecture and killed a lot of our own guys. So Churchill was so shocked by it. Why have we reduced ourselves to acting like the Nazis or the Japanese and destroying cultural sites without a military value? And then we stopped firebombing or targeting cultural sites. So Truman said Kyoto is the cultural capital of all of Japan art museums, et cetera, gardens, Shinto shrines. So leave it. Tough decision, but leave it. Um, they uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, replaced it with Nagasaki and Nilgata was the backup. So they wanted, we're ready to go in August and the weather's bad. Cloudy, poor conditions, lack of visibility. Uh, they have, you have to use radar. So we replace everything and we throw Hiroshima up from number three to number one. Uh, three days later, we go in. Uh, and, and it's Nagasaki, it's the weather's bad. We almost didn't hit Nagasaki. They were flying around at as late as 11 o'clock in the morning, and the clouds were so bad, they couldn't see. Then all of a sudden, the clouds dissipate, and we go in and drop the second bomb, which was the boxcar, right? You all know the Enola Gay B-29, the boxcar was the second one we dropped. Um, so the deployment, a bizarre story that I'm probably you know about. The ship that took the bombs the Tinian Island was the USS Indianapolis, one of the history's most ill-fated, horrific ships. It drops the bombs off at Tinian Island where they're assembled just days before deployment. The USS Indianapolis turns and starts heading back. It's hit by a sub. It's sunk and the men are floating in the water for days and thousands of sharks are attracted. And every hour the men are eaten by sharks. We lose most of the men on the ship by being eaten by sharks on the, so just the tragedy of this case. So um, 
So Hiroshima was a uranium bomb. That was little boy, U-235, everybody. Uh, a gun-type fusion bomb uh, was dropped on August 6th. Captain Paul Tibbetts in the Enola game, which was a B-29 super fortress. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, you can put two of them in this room. So they're big, but not giant. Okay, they're big, but not giant. Um, a 30,000 foot high mushroom cloud, 140,000 people dead in the time it takes me to put my fingers instantly. Another 140,000 uh, injured from this. Uh, Truman gives the Japanese three days. Why? Primitive transportation, rudimentary communications. He wants to give them time to digest the horrors of what just happened so that they would surrender. Um, a lot of you know I'm a Harry Truman fan. Okay, everybody knows I'm a Harry Truman fan. And um, years ago, I used to bring the living Truman aides to town all the time. They're all gone now, tragically. But um, one of the senior aides, George Elsie, was seated beside Truman at Potsdam. And he's the one that gave Truman the intel report, and Truman said, hit him. Elsie's the one that then went, and Truman ordered a leafleting campaign. You fly over Japan, show about leaflets, tell me the Japanese surrender, tell your leaders to surrender. Stop now, or we're going to do this every couple of days until the end of time. Remember, we only had two bombs, but Truman was a good poker player. Um, and uh, the Japanese response, and I interviewed George Elsie three times, one of the most amazing people I've ever met. I met John Lewis, and I worked at the White House with Obama. Met some interesting people, but George Elsie was something else. He said that... Um, the response from the Japanese was basically a few. They were unmoved. So Truman said, hit him again. So we got the box car to deploy the plutonium 239 to Churchill, the fat man. Um, and we dropped that bomb. And uh, 20,000 foot high mushroom clouds, 74,000 killed in a snap of a finger and another 74,000. Uh, still, Japan was unmoved. So Truman does another leaflet campaign. He's told it'll be weeks before we have another bomb. He says, I'll give you a few days and we're coming again. Uh, on August 10th, Truman is so shocked by the horrors, he orders that we're not going to do this again. August 10th. Five days later, the Japanese surrender. And it's over. Proof is in the pudding. It saved a quarter to a half a million American lives. Now the Japanese lose a quarter million plus people. But in a invasion, city by city, street by street, and before we invaded, we would have firebombed every city. They would have lost millions. It would have been a year-long campaign, billions of dollars, a million lives, half a million dead Americans, and it would have changed the whole post-war complexion, not giving us time to rebuild Europe, feed Europe, save the planet. Japan surrendered, and it's over. Truman moves heaven and earth to rebuild Europe before the Marshall Plan which comes in three years later. Before it, we start rebuilding the ports, sending over um, food, medicine, flour, heating oil, coal, everything that everyone needs. So it worked, it worked. Uh, there's the image of uh, Hiroshima, of a uh, little boy. Uh, lest we forget the horrors. That's what it looked like after the bomb. That's Paul Tibbetts. You know, a day one can only imagine the nightmares that he, Truman, and others had, right? Uh, from this Oppenheimer. Um, so they picked the right guy. Um, Oppenheimer goes on to lead the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. Uh, um, Einstein's there. The Institute's still around, it's considered one of the world's foremost think tanks. Storied career. Um, then he's appointed chair of the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission. To help draft post-war atomic energy policy. But then Joe McCarthy, a uh, guy named Richard Nixon, and um, Republicans, let's be honest, um, let's be factual, drag him before the Congress. Um, HUAC, House on American Affairs Committee, commie committees, red hunting, red baiting, and destroy Oppenheimer's career and reputation, uh, attacking, despite the service he rendered to the country. And I thought the movie did a good job of revealing how horrible that was and how his career was destroyed. It took years for um, his reputation to be uh, renewed. He uh, lost his national security clearance. 
Uh, he was called a communist, lost his job, basically lost everything. Only a little over a year ago, Biden posthumously overturned this and reinstituted his national security uh, clearance, just posthumously to respect him for what he did. I mean, I can't believe it took that long, quite frankly. I can't believe it took that long. Um, he did lobby for nuclear non-proliferation, which I think is the right thing to do. But Oppenheimer was a little naive and idealistic. Um, Truman wanted nuclear non-proliferation, but he was more realistic about it. You know, um, I convened a national Harry Truman conference for 19 years. We were supposed to do it for 20, and then uh, something called COVID hit. Um, so we did 19 years. And um, at the end of every conference, and we had John Lewis was there, George Elsie, I just told you about, George McGovern, Brent Skilcroft, the Republican National Security Advisor, Truman's grandson, Clifton. We had, I mean, just, it was a wonderful event every year. And after our three days, like the 10 VIPs, we'd all sit around with me, we'd sit around a table and we'd play the Watson q and A. I'd throw out all sorts of questions about Truman. Would he have done this or done that? One year we spent about two hours, lots of um, uh, Mexican food and debated, um, would Truman have allowed the St. Louis safe harbor? And I, everybody had to go around and debate and argue the whole night and it was unanimous, everybody said yes. And then we asked about what other presidents would have had the courage to drop the bomb. And we all agreed Ike would have, but it was hard to come up with agreement on many others, except if you're just a dumbass and you say drop it without thinking it through. Remember those that served in uniform, the George Washingtons, the Grants, the Ikes, they had a very mature attitude towards war. Remember the old Robert E. Lee notion? It's good that war is held, lest we grow too fond of it, right? Um, so um, Truman dropped it. Um, uh, even though he wanted nuclear non-proliferation. Uh, Oppenheimer's career was ruined. Uh, thank goodness for the movie. There's Harry. Um, Operation Paperclip. He gets heat for that. We snatch uh, Nazi scientists. Now, it's really, really difficult to think that Nazi scientists got a Kush lab and a salary and got to just play with whatever weapons they were making. But we won. Uh, it allowed us to move ahead. Um, he reformed the U.S. military. Truman created the Department of Defense. He created the Pentagon, the Department of the Air Force, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the National Security Council, and completely streamlined the military. So we'll be better ready for the next war. Uh, remember Japan, he said, killed at least 6 million Chinese, Indonesians, Koreans, Filipinos. Japan was not innocent. They started it. The invasion of China and Manchuria in the 30s. Pearl Harbor, they started it with us, right? Uh, lest we forget all that. Japan lost two and a half billion of its own people and were unmoved. Uh, we're talking about a couple small islands. Um, most Japanese were killed during the air raids. More Japanese were killed in the air raids than in dropping the two bombs. Yes. Um, a lot of people argue, well, the only reason we dropped the bomb was to justify the costs. Uh, General Groves later said something like, if the country found out how much we spent and we didn't use it, I would have been dragged before Congress and removed from office. So Groves was conscious of it. Truman didn't drop it because of the costs. He didn't drop it to send a message to Uncle Joe Stalin. Truman dropped it to end the world's worst war and the world's worst case of genocide. Get it over. Um, but why the second bomb? Some people say we shouldn't have dropped the second bomb. In the three days after the first bomb, the Japanese were completely unmoved. Hirohito and Tojo were not going to change. So he hit them again. And you know what? It worked. So if we had to do it twice, we had to do it twice. 67 cities were destroyed in incendiary firebombing, and Japan was unmoved. Uh, the population was starving. The war was unwinnable. They were fanatical. Um, so we need to remember uh, all of this. Um, most veterans favored dropping the bomb. Uh, so I'm a Truman fan, and I have the great honor and privilege of serving on the Truman Foundation Board. And every year I go to the Truman Library and do research and give a lecture. And I remember my very first one, I think it was 98, okay? Um, I went there, and I was so excited. Um, and we had about 400 people in the auditorium, and my topic was the bomb. And I was going to read all the Truman letters and for the audience. And there were probably 20, 25 World War II veterans in the audience. And they all had the hats on. 
And um, as I was finishing the lecture, one by one, they stood up and they said, I was on a ship headed to Japan. And my commanding officer said, your assignment is to go write a letter to your mom because you're not going to see her again. Another one stood up and said, our commanding officer said, look to your left and look to your right. At least one, maybe two of you three guys aren't coming back. Go put your affairs in order. And every one of them said that. Then they started saying, you know, my children wouldn't be alive today. But Truman dropped the bomb and we're alive. So when you think of it that way, and I remember trying to hold back tears while we were doing all that, the whole audience was. And I also remember thinking, thank God I advocated dropping the bomb, you know, because, wow, that was powerful to listen to those guys talk about they wouldn't be here today. Um, 153 leading scientists signed a petition to Truman to stop the, uh, uh, the bombing. Today, if you go uh, to uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there's a peace park. Anybody been there? Um, we're going back in mid-March. I'm leading a cruise and a tour of World War II. Theme one, we're going to Nagasaki, Hiroshima, Kyoto, uh, Nagura. We're going all over. Um, so um, at any rate, uh, George Elsie, the one I told you, was seated beside Truman. He also told me that after the war, if Truman didn't drop the bomb, he would have been impeached. Because the country would have said, we just buried a half a million men and spent a year dying over there. And you had something to prevent a loss of lives. How many Americans died in dropping the two bombs? Zero. So, uh, you know, if you look at it that way. Uh, we've The world has pursued nuclear non-proliferation. Almost every country in the world. Israel doesn't talk about it. They never talk about whether they have one or not and don't sign the treaties. Um, you know, North Korea, Pakistan, uh, the usual suspects. Um, the United States is no longer a signatory member of the nuclear non-proliferation. The previous president pulled us out of it. Um, we pushed to get back in, but one of the two parties has said no in the Senate. So we're aligned with, uh, you know, well, there we are. Um, so uh, nuclear non-proliferation. And that's the story of the Manhattan Project. Thank you, William. Questions, comments? How about me? What do you want to talk about? Sir? Excellent. If the bomb had been developed a year earlier, FDR was still alive, right? Died April 12th, 1945. Cerebral hemorrhage in Warm Springs, Georgia, Warm Springs, Georgia with his mistress. Um, so, um, would they have dropped it on Germany? I don't think they would, we would have. I don't think we would have hit Germany more than if, if the war was still continuing like that because of racism. Because they were white. They were European. I don't think we would have. I do think FDR would have used the bomb. Uh, Truman, you know, we know. I probably, yeah. Uh, but uh, no, I don't think we would have hit Germany. Which is alarming to think about. Unless, unless the V-2 rocket campaign was much more successful. The V-1, named for vengeance, right? The V-1 rockets were, they were not accurate, but they were faster than anything we had, and they were terrorizing Britain. The V-2 was way bigger, way more powerful, and way faster. Still weren't accurate. What if the Nazis had improved the accuracy and they were able to hit targets everywhere? Um, what if they got a hold of an atomic bomb? Then we would have been forced in Germany. What if, what if, what if? But had things just remained the same, I think we're racist enough we wouldn't have dropped it on Europe, but we didn't have a problem dropping it in Japan. Um, yikes. Yeah, sir? Three names. Moberg. Moberg, the uh, baseball, Jewish baseball player slash spy, uh, who did some amazing things to try to prevent the uh, the access, right? What a story. made the decision that the Germans couldn't do it. Yeah. According to experts that studied Mo Berg, when he was going to Germany and going to Japan, he learned the language passively on the way. What an impressive guy, right? Uh, yeah, and he said he didn't think, oops, I'm sorry. He said he didn't think that they, I had 13 shoes and I'm stepping on everything, but uh, it's because I didn't get enough cookies, damn it. Uh, so, uh, anyway, yeah. Huh? Rosenberg, yeah. The Russians had views. What did the Rosenbergs do to him? So the Rosenbergs, this is one of the cases in history that I never weigh in on one way or the other. 
because everybody has an opinion on the Rosenbergs, but nobody really knows. Um, I guess my opinion, if anything, would be to trust Truman and trust the process. If they had enough, we knew there were a lot of spies. There were a lot of information being leaked. If we had enough to bring them in, and none of us have gone through the records, unless if you're the former head of the National Security Council, and I don't know that. None of us have gone through the records. So uh, I don't know, but I know I disagree with people that say they were innocent. We shouldn't have. You don't know. You didn't read the record. Um, and it's a global war. So, yeah. And third? Third day, J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover, yeah. 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 Yeah, J. Edgar Hoover and McCarthy and others were just obsessed with the Red Scare. It's hard to imagine J. Edgar Hoover holding that job as long as he did, right? Everyone, how scary, how alarming. Uh, you know, I mean, he'd be at home in our politics today. But we need to remember, it wasn't just J. Edgar Hoover. A couple of decades earlier, it was Henry Ford. A couple, uh, then it was Father Charles Coughlin. Then it was Charles Lindbergh. And, uh, I mean, there were probably a good 20 plus members of Congress that were full on Nazi sympathizers during the war. Um, so it was alarming, the situation, Hoover and all the way through. So um, America's in a pinch right now. I don't know about you, but I can't sleep. Um, I'm really worried. I think, um, I think in November, what's really on the ballot is the rule of law and democracy. That's what's on the ballot. Um, the fork in the road is an overused, you know, symbol. But um, we truly are at a fork in the road. The only thing that keeps me from, you know, moving to New Zealand and digging a hole in my backyard and put everything in it is we've been there before. We made it through Hoover. We made it through Ford. We made it through right. Um, but none of them was president, and none of them had an entire Congress that didn't believe in science or evolution. So, and um, we have social media today, and people listen to folks like Kanye and Kim Kardashian. So, um, yeah, I'm really worried about it. Yeah, we some despicable characters, no question. I'm with you. Uh, let me get it one or two more, and we'll call it. Yeah. Why wasn't Groves a five star general? Why wasn't Groves a five star? There's only been been a handful of people in history that have put five stars in. Just a handful. Um, and that you got to be uh, the Supreme Allied Commander like Ike or like Grant in charge of the entire Civil War. Uh, you need to be command. Groves did not command troops in battle. He was overseeing a project. So uh, he, he didn't, I think he was impressive, but he didn't deserve uh, all those stars. Not even General Milley. Milley had four, right? The, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Milley only had four. Four stars are hard to get. And that's rare, right, everyone? At five, yeah, that's, we gotta be full out war, you gotta be commanding. So Groves, I think his legacy is um, is improving as people take a closer look at him, but um, yeah. Uh, I, I would not put extra stars in it. Let me get one more. Anyone? Yes, ma'am. If the bombs had not been dropped, it would have been a bloodbath. No question. Uh, as I said, it's not a theory, everyone. The Japanese code was cracked, and you can read it. You can apply for a Freedom of Information Act request in the 1974 rule, or you can be a scholar, or you can have contacts with the National Archives. I sat in the basement and read these things years ago. Uh, it's there. We cracked the code. We know that Japan was planning on a bloodbath, a street by street, suicide bombers, kamikaze pilots. Japan was going to go down swinging. There was also a plot by a group of like arch nationalists, like major colonel rank mid-level officers to possibly capture Hirohito to prevent him from surrendering. That's not a conspiracy. We cracked the code and there was chatter. How serious was the plan? Don't know. But there was chatter to keep him from surrendering. They were going to go down, last man, woman, right? In Iwo Jima, didn't people jump off cliffs rather than Harry Carey, right? Um, we, Okinawa, we, we were telling them um, uh, we were telling them with Japanese interpreters, we have flamethrowers. You know, if you come out now, you'll live. If not, and they, they took the flamethrower. Ten years after the war, 
we found half naked Japanese soldiers running around Guam and Koh Phraya and Pompeii, stealing chickens with a gun, one bullet left, still wanting to fight. Um, they were fanatical. This thing would have been an unimaginable bloodbath. As we all know, as Israel knows now, as we all know, any urban or warfare is just, um, armies aren't built for the urban warfare. Uh, it's difficult. So uh, when you look at all that together, um, I am uh, completely behind dropping both bombs. I think it, 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 it